Hi everyone and welcome to week three of Counselling Skills 2. This week uh, we are looking at suicide and crisis interventions. The readings for this week are Geldard and Geldard, chapters 34 on crisis intervention and chapter 35 on suicide intervention, as well as of, the, as well as, of course the online materials for this week. The materials cover, uh, and also Geldard and Geldard cover, the, some of the statistics around suicide. Um, the essence of these is that in 2009, at least 1,633 men died by suicide and at least 499 women died by suicide. I say at least because often there's, um, often there's deaths that uh, are ambiguous, um, things like uh, motor vehicle accidents or other um, possible accidental deaths that aren't attributed uh, as suicide. More women attempt suicide um, but more men succeed due to more violent methods. Uh, that specifically refers to women um, tending to use overdoses of alcohol, drugs, um, pharmaceuticals and um, other household um, chemicals, whereas men are most more likely to use ropes, guns, knives and heavy machinery, um, and so their likelihood of success is much higher. There's a tendency which I'm just noticing in myself to possibly keep this a little bit dry. Um, it's a really emotional area. I think that most people have um, been affected by suicide in some way. Certainly I don't think I've ever spoken to anyone um, you know, amongst friends or family who hasn't been affected by suicide in some way. Most of us um, know someone who took their own life or um, know of someone who took their own life. And for many of us, it'll be somebody who's very, very close to us. Um, and there's certainly people I know that have had a number of people in their family um, take their own lives. So it's a really emotional topic and it is close to our own hearts. Our job as the counsellor is to engage with this risk of suicide, to acknowledge its reality, and essentially to be the one who's brave enough in the client's life to talk about it. So it all starts with us and sometimes there can be an inherent conflict between our own values. Some people might believe that suicide is a personal choice, that this is something that, um, you know, it's a person's life, so they, they should be able to choose whether they take their own life. Uh, for other people, um, you might feel that, no, no crime, uh, suicide is a crime. You, you know, taking your own life is a, is a, is a crime or an offence against life itself. And certainly, you know, if you have a, have a religious background, um, you're likely to see um, the taking of life as um, ungodly. So what about you? Are you able to talk about death, dying, suicide in an open way? And if you feel that you can't, um, there's no time like the present to start practicing. And um, just find people that you do know who can talk about death. Often old people are good at talking about death and suicide. And start just start having the conversations and um, see how you know, how emotional you can you can get. And sometimes you need to let yourself be emotional um, to sort of come out the other side and and be a bit more resilient around these really difficult themes. So our legal obligations come back to the legal obligations that every person in our society has. And so every single one of us in, in Australia has a duty of care to protect the life and property of a person um, that we know to be at risk. So if we have a, concern, a genuine concern, if we're able to see that a person might be at risk of harm to themselves or others, then we've got a responsibility to do something about it and to mitigate or reduce the risk of that harm occurring. So there's some cultural factors in, involved in, in suicide in terms of being able to identify risk. Um, as a starting point, we know that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men um, are dramatically overrepresented in suicide statistics um, and also other kind of Islander men are also likely, um, so Pacific Islander men are more likely to be represented in suicide statistics as are all new migrants, uh, particularly refugees are dramatically overrepresented in suicide statistics. The thing about the um, uh, new migrants is that they don't appear in our suicide statistics because they're not Australian citizens or residents. Um, so for Aboriginal people and for people who are refugees, there's the real, very real um, trauma of dispossession 
and for Aboriginal people, there's generational trauma following the stolen generation. Many people who arrive as new migrants have come from war-torn um, countries. They've been living in refugee camps um, in very poor conditions for many years, and um, they've often seen things, horrific things, that most of us um, only ever see um, dramatised in, in cinema. So the risk factor of thoughts, is a client thinking about it? Is a person um, talking about suicide? Um, the, the more thoughts of suicide there are, the greater the, res the risk of suicide. Are the thoughts current? Are they persistent? Are they strong or urgent? Are the risk factors that, as, as you have more and more of these with a particular client, the risk of suicide goes up. So is a client expressing the desire to be gone, to be away, for it to be over, for things to be finished, to make it stop, uh, to make the pain go away? Um, are they, will they be, I think they'd be better off without me. Maybe I should just go. Maybe I shouldn't be here. All these kinds of throwaway lines um, tell you that there's a suicide risk. Does the client have a suicide plan? Uh, does, do they have, so you, and well, we'll get onto a list of questions in a moment, but really you just ask. There's no beating around the bush. Um, as a counsellor, it's our job just to ask. Does the client have the capacity to enact the plan? Does that mean that they have the resources? Do they have the gun? Do they have the car? Do they have the rope? Do they have um, whatever is required to enact their plan? Um, often you'll, you'll talk to a client about a plan and it'll just be an unrealistic plan. And in some sense, that's a sense of relief. It's like, okay, that's possibly a long way from happen happening. Has there been previous attempts at suicide? Uh, what happened in those attempts? Have friends and family members suicided? Is there existing depression or psychosis? Is there a history of substance use and abuse? Is there recent loss and bereavement? Well, these are all things that can contribute to our risk, uh, our assessment of the risk. And then we take into account protective factors, the immediate supports of the client living with others. Do they have social supports? Do they have relationships with others? Are they making plans for the future? Uh, do they have short and long-term goals, goals which give them meaning and purpose? Uh, are they able to engage with counselling? If they're engaging with you as the counsellor, if they're being open, they're disclosing their, their experience and you're able to be open to that and empathic with that, that in itself increases hope. So while we might be feeling absolute despair listening to a client, our sharing of that despair with them um, increases their hopes um, and leaves them feeling as though they're not alone. Ambivalence. Um, does the person have doubts about living or dying? Is, this, is there actually an active argument going on inside them? Do they have some fundamental values and purpose uh, in life um, that mean that that's keeping them here? So while they think about dying and how that would solve their problems, they've actually got a strong connection to staying. Intervening in suicide. So it's something that you are ethically obliged to do whether you think it's the right thing or not. Um, even breaking confidentiality. So the, the, the value of um, safety um, trumps the value of confidentiality. So it's up to us to break confidentiality and seek help for a client, even if a client doesn't want us to. And if we have anxieties, fears and dilemmas around that, then the appropriate place for that is supervision. Okay, so just ask. So you want, would ask a client, um, and, and while I'm saying this, just think about what being a client yourself for this moment and think, okay, if I was a client, um, how might I respond to these questions and um, would it help me feel that the client, the, the counsellor was open to me or how would it make you feel? Okay, so when were your most recent thoughts about suicide? How frequent are these thoughts? When are they the strongest? How comforting or distressing are these thoughts uh, for you? Do they distress you or do they leave you feeling more comforted? Have you previously attempted suicide? How long ago was that suicide attempt? What happened? What about now? Do you have a plan? What is that plan? So you're gonna need a few things to carry out that plan. Do you have those things? Are those things that you're available to you at the moment? Okay. So one of the things, one of the main questions that comes up for students is, oh no, why don't I put all these ideas into the client's head? That's a common fear. Um, and it's almost a standard fear. I remember having it myself um, when I was starting out and thinking about suicide risk. Oh no, I don't want to, to give the client the idea that they could commit suicide. It, um, it just doesn't work that way. That is not what happens. And the openness actually um, really supports clients to 
you know, deal with something that they haven't been able to, to mention to anyone else. So if they feel like they can't tell their therapist either, that makes things a whole lot worse for them. So assessing the risk. So the assessment is unique to each client. It's up to us to explore the client's experience of their world in its totality and the place of their thoughts of death within that whole world view. It's up to us to accept the complexities, ambiguities and paradoxes in the discussion. Even if it doesn't make sense to us, we need to stay open to our experience of the client. And it, it's not going to make sense if you don't want to die yourself and someone's talking about dying. It won't make sense to you. So this is an ongoing process over weeks, months, even years, and we have to err on the side of caution. So overdo the suicide risk rather than not doing enough. You can see, you can see that cl clearly the risk of not doing enough is far worse. Uh, the outcome is far worse than, than overdoing it and, and asking too many clients about suicide risk. Okay, work collaboratively, be open, share why we're asking the questions and share why we're feeling concerned. Actively engage with other professionals when you're concerned about a client. Um, take all threats, warning signs and risk factors seriously. Sometimes can, workers can fall into the trap of, oh, they just want attention. It's not, it's not, it might be true, um, but it doesn't mean that we don't take the threats seriously. Always ask the hard questions. So as soon as you sense the client is thinking about being, you know, other people being better off without them, actively assess the risk. This is the therapy. Um, helping the client talk about their own death is the effective treatment for it. Can we under, uncover the underlying message? What is the client trying to communicate? Is it pain, frustration? What are they trying to control? Is it their lone life? Is it their own destiny? Is it their own choices? And what it might they be trying to avoid? Pain, dilemma, confusion. Work with the cultural context the and disconnections with their own culture. Document everything. Keep comprehensive notes because one day a court might need it. So this is the video, um, which is for your assignment. The aim here is to be both very open and reflective around your own biases, thoughts and experiences and also to use the literature to see where the literature um, echoes and supports uh, your own th experiences and ideas. Okay, so looking at crisis. Crisis is a sudden and unexpected trauma with the potential for heightened maturity and growth or for the deterioration and greater vulnerability to future stress. So it's really good to think about crisis and trauma as kind of um, being a set of scales and it could go either way it could be wow this person has what they that they call post-traumatic growth or the person goes into a spiral um, of deterioration and vulnerability the external impacts are things like death relationship breakdown illness um, personal attack crime rape experience of disaster um, internally um, Precipitations of, of crisis are suicidal thoughts, depression, anxiety and panic, psychosis, uh, reactions to drug and alcohol. And often crisis is, occurs in life transitions, kids moving out of home, commencing relationships, the experience of divorce, um, thinking about re moving into retirement, the, um, the death of a loved one. Thinking about our own death and dying. Okay, intervening in a crisis is about providing a temporary but immediate relief for an emerging situation. Our job is to deal with the panic, stay calm, normalize. We'll learn about normalizing um, soon this term. To the extent that the client is now safe, you can remind the client of this. Listen to his or her story, express warmth and empathy for the client's experience um, in as, as much as the circumstances will, about, will allow. Um, if it's helpful, you can be very directive in a crisis, saying things like, I want you to just to stop and breathe for a minute. Okay. Stay on the phone to me and now use another phone to call the police or to call your parents. So you can be quite directive um, in a crisis. It's important um, when working with crisis to know the limits of your role and to stay within them. Uh, the laws, regulations, professional ethics, organisational policies and procedures. And this is really all about sometimes we have to say no when a client is desperate. So a tip is to collect as much psychoeducational resources and referral contacts that you can that might be relevant to your client group and always keep them close at hand. Um, I keep these things on my phone um, so I'm able just to sort of open up my phone, open up a file and provide um, some resources and contact details usually by email to my clients where you can do it in hard copy. So this is uh, acti uh, activity 3.4, it's at the end. This is about Ken's bushfire. So read through the case study and think about how you would respond um, to Ken. Um, and I've broken down the elements elements there. Thinking, think, really think about how you would uh, engage with Ken. Um, 
verbally. So this is all I have time for uh, today and hopefully she can now outline